Hi everybody, this is Alf speaking. Welcome to Blockworks. From now onwards, I will be collaborating with them. So make sure you subscribe to the Blockworks macro channel to, to make sure you don't lose any of these hopefully nice interviews. My guest today is Victor Schwetz. He's a managing director at Macquarie Capital and he's the head of global and Asia Pacific strategy. Hi, Victor. How are you doing? Very good, Alf. How are you? Hey, all good here. Um, let's have a chat about uh, markets this time, and then let's zoom back and talk about the macro underlying reasons why certain markets are trading certain ways. Before the interview, we were debating how markets are basically pricing, pricing in a soft landing, no regime changes, despite all the chatters we read in newspapers that there's going to be regime changes here and there. So guide us through a bit. Why do you think it's also placid in basically all asset classes out there. No, you're absolutely right. <clears throat> I mean, if you think of everything we're going through right now, we have a war, we have a pandemic, we have a lockdown in China, uh, we have commodity prices that tripled uh, in the last uh, two years, we have inflationary spike, and we have a rise in interest rates and tightening of both monetary and fiscal policies. And if you think of the markets, uh, just, just look at the high yield spreads. <clears throat> just in the last three or four weeks, it's gone down to a normal level. It's uh, roughly about three and a half percent. It's a little bit higher than three percent historic low, but usually this should be six. Uh, it should be seven percent. Even triple C bonds, which is basically are defaulting or on the verge of defaulting, <clears throat> they are at about seven percent. Normally, it would have been around 12 percent or, or, or even more. Uh, if you think of equity markets, yes, they've suffered, uh, but MSCIC world is only down about 6%. As a considering what we have experienced, that's incredibly low. There is intraday volatility, and there is quite a lot of intraday volatility. But if you look at VIX, if you look at any equity market uh, volatility indicators, they're very benign. There is a little bit more in currencies, but again, considering what we should be experiencing, <clears throat> it's really nothing. So the question is, why, why is that? And to me, there are three reasons for that. Uh, number one, uh, clearly investors have decided that Federal Reserve's got it, uh, or Central Bank got it, <clears throat> in a sense that um, inflation is not going to run away uh, and they will control it as we go forward. Um, and, and to some extent, you can agree with that because if you think of uh, inflationary outcomes right now, uh, even in the most inflationary countries, they're starting to come off. Uh, if you think of inflation break-even rates, things like five by five, they seem to be shaken a little bit, but they're really anchored still uh, at around two and a half percent. If you think of wages outcomes, even in the more inflationary economies like US or UK, they're starting to come off. And there is no evidence of any embedding of inflation into wages. And certainly there is no inflationary spiral either in Japan, uh, China, or, or, or Eurozone. <clears throat> so the first area is that the market does believe that central bank got it and there won't be inflationary problem. I think the second related reason are commodities. I think investors have concluded that probably commodity complex is at its high point. Uh, and remember, all the indexes are delta, they're differences. So in other words, commodity prices don't really have to collapse. Uh, in order to give you a neutral to negative reading uh, as you go forward. Uh, and so I think investors concluded that probably going forward, changes will be neutral or, or changes will be negative rather than continuing to escalate as you go forward. And, and that's a big sort of support pillar. Uh, and the third area uh, is clearly that monetary policies at this stage are still quite accommodative. Uh, and that's related to where neutral rates is versus the policy rates. So in the case of the United States, clearly the policy rates are at least 200 basis points uh, below neutral rates. In Eurozone, it's much less than that, but you probably still have at, uh, maybe 100 basis points in there, uh, a little bit less in the UK. Uh, then if you think of Japan, clearly there is no capacity to tighten at all, but China is liquefying and China will be supporting liquidity as we go forward. So overall, generally, monetary policies are still supportive. All central banks need to do now is to basically execute what the market expects them to. Don't, don't front run it. Don't try to be worse. <clears throat> Just execute what you do. And so a combination of those three things are really tempering down uh, the volatilities. But as you correctly said, 
Uh, this is sort of an immaculate lending. This is like a perfect lending. Monetary policy doesn't over tighten. Fiscal policy doesn't over tighten. Wars don't get out of control. Geopolitics doesn't get out of control. The lockdowns don't get out of control. It's just a perfect outcome. Any one of those ingredients can lead you to a, a very different answer. Well, Victor, this is a great intro. Let's unpack some of the concepts for the audience. So you discussed about neutral rate and you said, you know, the Federal Reserve from a monetary policy perspective is around about a 200 basis point away from this neutral rate. And markets are pricing in though a tightening cycle that will bring us above this neutral rate. So 250, 300 basis point of hikes are priced over the next 12 months. Could you please define for the audience what is this neutral rate and how do you believe that despite bond markets pricing the Federal Reserve to hike above this neutral rate, so literally to tight restrictive levels, markets somehow are still pricing in that, you know, it's going to be a soft landing? Yeah, you, neutral rate, as you as you just highlighted, is basically a rate at which economy neither stimulated uh, nor it is in a contractionary mode. Now, it's not an observable number. Uh, it's nobody really knows what it is, but there is plenty of literature out there trying to compute the levels based on demographics, productivity, technology, long term structural issues. And generally speaking, the view is that U.S. real rates are about should be about zero. Now, if you take a sort of five by five inflationary break-even rate, that gives you to a nominal rate of, call it around two and a half percent. And that's why you have about 200 basis points. And Victor, sorry, the five by five inflation break-even rates for the audience, we're talking about how market participants, so the collective intelligence, let's say, of fixed income participants expects US inflation to be between 2027 and 2032. So five year ahead, five year inflation expectations. As you were saying, Victor, around two and a half percent. That makes a nominal rate of around about two point twenty five, two and a half percent. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. <clears throat> That's right. And so there is about two hundred basis points uh, in order to reach that level. Now we can debate how much neutral rates could change over time. Uh, and whether they will go up or go down. I, I think the chances side actually will continue going down as we go forward. Uh, but we can debate that. Um, and, and so the market is actually assuming them to become restrictive. Now, if they do become restrictive, uh, then the market expects that there will be no inflation and no growth as you go forward. So the further down the curve you go, that is why 30-year money finally managed to get to about 3%, but I don't think it's going to stay there. Uh, and so what you see is a flattening of the yield curves occurring. Now, only two, three weeks ago, for example, a lot of those pieces of the curve actually was already inverted. Uh, now, some of them still are, uh, but there was some little bit of a steepening occurring. So, for example, uh, uh, 5 and 30 now is slightly positive. 2 in 10 is now slightly positive. So parts of the curve is a little bit more positive now. But essentially what the market is saying, the market is pricing in and at the same time what they're expecting it is to have a very negative outcome, both for growth and inflation uh, as you go forward. Uh, now, my answer to that is that as, they, as central banks approach uh, a star or a neutral rate, the volatility of asset prices will increase substantially. And when that happens, central banks really will not have a choice but to alter, alter communication policy, alter actual policy. At the same time, central banks these days have a lot more tools. Remember when we had um, a repo market heart attack, for example, in uh, October 2019? Yeah. Uh, now, Today, Federal Reserve actually have a standby lines available, which are not part of a QE, it's not part of any other policy, but it's there. So if suddenly there is a freezing of interbank markets or a repo market, they can just put liquidity incredibly fast. So they actually have more tools today, not only compared to 2008, but also compared to 2018, 19. Um, and so there is a flexibility in the system uh, in order to try to continue tightening without the same impact. You can do more QT rather than physical tightening. Uh, you can deploy other means or other liquidity measures in the marketplace. Um, but, but ultimately, ultimately what it tells you is the effective tightening. In other words, if you combine QTs, if you combine repo, exceptional, if you combine everything else, they can't get ahead of uh, 25 
uh, in a nominal term, so zero in real terms. It can't go higher than that. Uh, and, and I think that's what the market is telling, because what the market will do if they continue going, they'll just invert it. Uh, now, it, the fact that yield curve inverse <clears throat> doesn't mean you necessarily immediately have a recession. But what it does do, it reduces flow of credit. It reduces flow of activity as you go forward. And if you leave it unattended and leave it inverted for any length of time, ultimately you are going to uh, end up in a recession. So, Victor, basically we have a bond market which is already smart enough to understand that ultimately the Federal Reserve and other central banks can go with the hiking cycle, but it's going to be a relatively short one. And once they reach, you know, in the US around about 2%, 2.5%, ah, that's it. And they're signaling it via an inverted yield curve over very long tenors. So we go to this 2 2.5% pretty fast, and then basically the bond market is telling you that's it. Credit spreads are also relatively tight compared to a, you know, declining growth economy, wars, pandemics, geopolitics, all these potential tail events. The only elephant in the room we haven't spoken yet that maybe perhaps is signaling that something might be changing are is the FX markets. So have you seen some issues brewing under the surface in Japan? What's your take there? Are the macro vigilantes at least waking up when it comes to Japan or all this you know, enthusiasm we're seeing about the yen is also somehow short-lived? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> of course, what we see right now, in my view, is uh, a globally coordinated tightening. Um, so not only we have a globally coordinated fiscal policy, which is being tightened, but we have a globally coordinated monetary policy that being tightened. Now, because you have a globally coordinated policy, the opportunity for arbitraging the yields, in other words, hunting for yields, <clears throat> becomes a little bit less pronounced. Uh, but, but there are a couple of places where there is a discrepancy in policies. Uh, one of them is China, but China controls its currency, uh, and China controls its capital account. Uh, but nevertheless, China on the opposite side of everybody. Uh, as everybody tightens, they're liquefying their spending. The other one is Japan. Uh, and as I said, in Japan, we can debate what is R square. Oh, sorry, R star. But the view generally is that it could be anywhere from negative 50 to negative 100 basis points. Uh, now, compared to zero, <clears throat> for example, in the United States, giving very low inflationary expectations, it basically tells you that the policy rates in Japan are either already above the neutral rate or they are at a neutral rate. So there is no capacity to tighten at all. Uh, and so Japan has to pursue a, a, a policy that is opposite to what the United States is doing, opposite to what Eurozone is doing. Uh, and the outcome is either central bank or my Ministry of Finance really interferes in the marketplace. <laughs> Alternatively, it will be reflected in the currencies. Uh, and that's what's happening. Because central banks is not into say, or oh, BOJ is not interfering and hasn't been interfering, it all flows through into the currencies. And that's why you can see 130, you can see even more uh, on the Japanese yen exchange rate. Uh, it's purely misalignment uh, of policies between bulk of the world and Japan. As I said, it's not reflected as much in China. It should be. I mean, renminbi should be heading to seven, uh, if, not, if not even higher than that. But because of the control the Chinese government has, you don't see it. But in Japan, you do. Uh, and so there is a dilemma now in Japan as well, because they're starting to import more inflation. Uh, into Japan. So you have commodity prices, you have currency importing, inflation starts picking up. Uh, and so it's, it's, a, it's a difficult situation because they can't allow rates to go up, uh, given the leverage that Japan is maintaining. Now, interestingly, if we look at uh, the spot moves in Japanese yen, they seem pretty scary. So we're going towards this 130 psychological level against the dollar. But we discussed before the show that if you look a bit under the curtain and you look at implied volatility that traders are pricing in options over the next one year, you end up looking at a JPY USD implied volatility of about eight to nine percent, Victor. I mean, if somebody would tell me eight to nine percent as an annualized volatility means around about half a percent of daily move, more or less, that's it. Half a percent of daily move is not really much, isn't it, if you expect fireworks in Japan. So even then, 
Market participants, again, are very calm and very placid. So what do you make out of that? Because they don't believe that this policy differential will last. <laughs> exactly what we just discussed. <clears throat> They're saying that Federal Reserve will do a couple of more moves. <clears throat> the market volatility will increase. Because remember, of course, long term is a sequence of short terms <clears throat> plus a premium attached to it. So theoretically, what Federal Reserve is doing should be translating across the curve. <clears throat> But it doesn't. It doesn't translate like that. And the reason doesn't translate like that because market doesn't believe. So the short end price is what Federal Reserve will do. The long end price is what will happen if they do it. Yes. Uh, and <laughs> essentially. <clears throat> and so what the market is saying is that that differential uh, between Japan and the rest of the world will disappear. Uh, and it could disappear quite quickly. In other words, it might not last uh, terribly long. Yeah, I think I have to agree, and especially your sentence on the long-end prices in what happens if they follow the shortened pricing is a pretty remarkable one. Good summary. Um, so we are talking about several corners of the market, Victor, that are that assume their strong base case is that ultimately there's going to be a soft landing and that monetary and fiscal authorities have and will keep control of what's going on. Now, most of this is based on the fact um, that policies will not be hiked way past what we define being a neutral rate. So you gave some numbers away and you said that in the US, this inflation adjusted neutral rate is around about 0%. In Japan is negative, in Europe is negative too. So shall we take a step back and discuss how do consensus reaches those numbers? So why would in the US the equilibrium real interest rates be 0%? I mean, how are what are the drivers behind this so-called R star? And that's an interesting thing because central bank policies are really short term uh, and very, very short end. Whilst R star they're aiming for is a long term concept. Uh, it's structural changes in the economy. Uh, it's a demographic and demographic trends. It's productivity trends. It's regulatory trends. It's anything that impacts supply of savings and utilization uh, of savings in various investment. So it's a hard job for central banks to do when they are aiming to change the short-term rates when they're responding to very long to structural R star. Uh, that could be moving very, very slowly <clears throat> or very sharply, depending on how assets are utilized. That's your Bernanke old concept of surplus of savings, for example, uh, that is depressing rates. Uh, that's part of it is corporate investment and why corporates are investing more in share buybacks or financial speculation rather than investing in infrastructure or building or productivity. Uh, that's also your multi-factor productivity. Why most of the world have been reporting declining Uh, total factor, multi-factor productivity. Uh, it's demographics and, and the labor force. So essentially in the US, most of these answers have been more positive than they were in Eurozone or Japan. Whether you look at demographics, whether you look at productivity, uh, whether you look at uh, uh, supply of capital, all of those things were more positive in the US. And that's why US is at a high level. But having said that, Uh, you have to remember that about 25, 30 years ago, uh, the R star for the United States was roughly around 3%. Wow. So if you had uh, inflation expectation of 2% or 3%, that's where your policy rates were at 5%. So even in the United States, uh, it has been a period of very sharp contraction of R star uh, over the last sort of two to three decades. Yeah, and actually the labor force growth uh, tends to play quite a role there. And as population ages across the world at different speed, but it does age across jurisdictions. And uh, obviously the, let's say, birth replacement rates are not good enough to make sure that we inject new labor force against the retirees that we have that are larger and larger. Labor force tend to shrink across the globe. The US is slightly better positioned than other jurisdictions mm -hmm. because of slightly um, you know, less fast aging process and some net immigration coming from other jurisdictions around the US that keep the labor force relatively okay. But if you look at the United Nations forecast, Victor, uh, mm -hmm. between now and 2050, the US labor force is supposed to expand around about 0% year on year. Right. And okay. China, Japan and Europe and Russia and many other uh, 
jurisdictions will see the labor force shrink. It is very difficult for a, a, an economy with a shrinking population to be able to produce increasingly high structural growth rate and therefore to support also higher interest rates down the road. Is that a fair summary? That's right. That's right. <clears throat> it is. <clears throat> the only thing to say is, and we'll see how it plays out, <clears throat> that as we embark on robotics, automation, artificial intelligence, <clears throat> as we embark on alternative transport and energy platforms, uh, the question is how much value does labor force uh, contribute? Uh, in other words, this is your replacement of the labor force. Yeah. <clears throat> and therefore, can you actually grow multi-factor productivity at a faster clip uh, to offset yeah. uh, lower labor contribution? Uh, but you're totally right. Even if you don't worry about 2050, just look at 2030. At 2030, uh, U.S. Uh, average aging and labor force will be about the same level where Japan was around 2000. <clears throat> so yeah. so uh, this shows you how quickly they all catch up to roughly the same territory. Uh, even some of the emerging markets. Uh, I mean, India still requires uh, 10, 11 million new jobs created every year. Uh, but they already passed the peak. So if you think next 10 or 15 years, even India uh, start joining the same game. Uh, the only exception to that uh, is Africa. Uh, that is a big exception. Uh, that's where you have at least another billion uh, younger people coming through. Uh, but that's more of a problem, I think, in terms of immigration development and everything else, uh, rather than enhancement of our stuff. And Pic um, uh, Piketty actually put out a chart a while ago. I found it extremely interesting. He looked at world population growth throughout centuries. And the post Second World War boom we had in terms of demographics was actually rather an exception where population growth in those decades was about one and a half percent year on year around the globe. Um, that is rather an exception if you look at centuries ago and also where are we going looking at projections down the road as we discussed, population growth is around about half a percent. So those decades where we saw a large um, influx of new labor force, fresh labor force in the 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s basically was rather an exception, Victor, than, than um, a normal tendency uh, of, of world demographics. Correct. Uh, in, in fact, that, that period not only have a lot of uh, labor force injection, but also reconstruction. Uh, because remember, 50s, 60s, 70s, even into 80s, you still have a lot of reconstruction activities. Uh, then, of course, we had China joining the world <clears throat> and with a booming demographics uh, at the time. Uh, and so a lot of those areas are no longer there. But as I said, I'm coming back to the same issue, uh, extent to which 10 or 15 years from now, whether we need factories, whether we need supply and value chains, extent to which uh, globalization will become irrelevant because we will no longer be shipping uh, little pieces of equipment from one country to another to be assembled in a, th in a third country to be shipped into the fourth country, <clears throat> which is basically what we're doing today. Uh, and so extent to which all of that will imply that labor will become increasingly less relevant and if it becomes increasingly less relevant, uh, that becomes a major issue for Africa uh, because those people will no longer be needed, even if their price is only $1 an hour or even less uh, than $1 an hour. Uh, but for the rest of the world, um, you could actually have a very strong productivity growth rates. Um, and, and the only question that becomes, what do we do with everyone and how do they make themselves useful and how do they make themselves, uh, or at least feel happy uh, about their life uh, if their contribution continues to erode? But that is a long-term issue. That's more like, as I said, 10, 20 years from now, uh, rather than what's going to happen next year or two or five. Yeah. Now, interestingly, coming back to markets, it seems that compared to even 2018, where in America, markets went to price real interest rates at 1%. So still relatively robust and um, back then higher than my estimate for our star in the US. Then something broke, which was the equity market sell off in the, in the last quarter of 2018. It seems like not only the equity markets, but also the bond market, the FX market, commodities, as we discussed, they now seem to know, Victor, to have a strong base case and to be much more informed about where the equilibrium real interest rates are 
to expect that policymakers will be able to accommodate basically the wind down of the monetary and fiscal excesses we've had during 2020 and 2021. Are there any corners of the market where you think this is mispriced? So the risk reward in you know going into an asset class rather than another might actually reward um, from a risk adjusted perspective. Well, in the longer term, you're absolutely right uh, that central banks will have no choice but to reverse their policies. And I've been arguing for quite some time that 2023 and 24, both monetary policy and fiscal policy will become loose again. They're not going to continue tightening, you know, eight, nine cycles, 10 cycles, whatever. <clears throat> All of that is going to reverse. Uh, and so the question then becomes not so much 23 and 24, but what actually is going to happen over the next two or three quarters, <clears throat> or four quarters, rather than the next two or three years. Because as we approach our star, as fiscal policies become more contractionary, and if you think of uh, you know the latest forecast by IMF or World Bank, I mean, they literally think that G4, G5 economies will have fiscal deficits of only 4%. <clears throat> That's coming off from 11, 12% in 2021. <clears throat> so as we continue to contract both fiscal uh, and monetary policies, as we get closer and closer to our star, volatility of asset prices must increase. Now, that implies that certain areas will be the most exposed. Now, those areas might be absolutely fine by the time central bank reverse their policies and fiscal authorities reverse their policies. But that's going to happen later in 23 and 24 rather than over the next sort of two or three or four quarters. Uh, and so one area is high yield markets. Clearly to me, at least in the short term, the risks are mispriced, particularly for things like triple C debt uh, and, and, and below. So that's, that's sort of one area where I think uh, there is a problem. Uh, the other area is uh, currencies. And one of the things, and I'm not a currency specialist, but one of the things you always look at as a strategist or an equity analyst is what happens to US dollar. Because one of the problems you have is what I discuss as a pincer movement, uh, rapid appreciation of US dollar and rapid dep depreciation of yen and renminbi. <clears throat> and so it is quite possible that over the next couple of quarters, instead of just crawling a little bit higher, we could have a very significant jump in US dollar and another very significant leg down both in yen and renminbi. Now, that potentially could put a number of asset classes in danger. For example, uh, emerging market equities. Uh, that's the most obvious class that will be put in danger because rising US dollar and declining yen is deflationary globally. So if you're an emerging market that is trading on a reflation or cyclicality, uh, you're not going to see that. If you're an emerging market that borrowed in external currency, uh, and remember, 75% of all of the external debt, non-resident debt, that's when you borrow in somebody else's currency. 75% uh, of that is in US dollar and US dollar denominated. <clears throat> so whenever you do that, uh, you could have emerging market equities, particularly more vulnerable emerging market equity suffering. So there are corners like that that you can you can see that will be uh, on the sort of uh, spear edge, so to speak, of volatilities uh, when those volatilities uh, do come through. But slightly longer term, uh, as the market are telling you, we're going to normalize. So in other words, central banks will give up. Uh, you're going to have less growth. Inflation will whip so back to possibly disinflation uh, as you go forward. Uh, and so that will provide another impetus to support uh, risky assets, to support risky propositions, whether it's a high yield or unprofitable technology companies. Yeah. So basically, we are in this pendulum situation where we have had this monetary and fiscal excesses that have led to large risk taking and strong performance in every high beta asset class out there. We're now facing a situation where markets expect pretty much of a soft landing uh, from now onwards which you seem to disagree uh, or not entirely disagree, but at least uh, seem to consider the risk reward of certain asset classes, especially weak balance sheet exposed asset classes like high yield, CCC debt, uh, some emerging market economies highly reliant on dollar funding. Those seem to be relatively uh, exposed here, but longer term, 
you seem to be pretty firm in the camp that there is no regime change at the end of the day, Victor. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. Uh, I think one of the things, Alf, we always bring up quite well is uh, the question of fat tails, that we're no longer dealing in sort of normal uh, statistical distribution. Uh, and normal statistical distribution is what all economic theories, as well as finance theories and investment theories are based on. So if you don't have a normal distribution, if you have those fat tails, uh, then it's almost impossible to estimate or predict uh, the outcomes of what's going to happen. Uh, and so what we're getting now is more and more of those fat tails. They become an integral part of um, our landscape. They're not anomalies. They're not something that happens now and again. It's something that is permanent. Now, if you say that, <clears throat> and if you say there are a lot of those fat tails, <clears throat> then you can either try to trade them somehow, even though they're not unpredictable, and even though they, you cannot estimate them. Uh, alternatively, what you do, you will say, well, the reality is that liberal capitalism really no longer exists. Uh, free functioning markets really no longer exist. Uh, uh, and as we go forward, they will exist even less. In other words, the government will interfere more, whether it's a regulatory requirements. <clears throat> For example, the governments can say that every pension fund must accumulate sovereign bonds in order to protect pensioners and safeguard their same, or whatever the excuse uh, they got to offer. Uh, they can lock it up like they did in 1950s, for example. Uh, the other areas could be sort of carrots and sticks they will provide for corporates to behave in a certain manner, which might involve certain infrastructure investments or certain social policies uh, that they might want to pursue. <clears throat> so if you argue that, uh, then you would say that longer term, the government would not allow volatilities to get out of control they will be controlling those volatilities. That means that the same triple C debt that could go bankrupt uh, in the next two or three quarters will be revived by the time you get to the end of 23, uh, early 2024. Because the new world is driven by a combination of financialization that we can't stop uh, because we eat today even more leverage. We're even more dependent on asset prices than what we were during dot-com or GFC <clears throat> or even prior to COVID. So financialization cannot stop, which means we have to create more and more liquidity in capital than what we need, which means cost of capital must continue to fall. <clears throat> Secondly, we're relying more and more on the government uh, and fiscal policy will be coming in regularly. And when it does, inflation will spike. When they come off, inflation will come off. So this sort of pendulum uh, we'll have to live with uh, and the third area is that if you combine financialization with the government, if you combine it with technology, you get geopolitical tensions, you get social tensions, you have polarization tensions. And again, this will continue. Uh, and the government has to keep the Humpty Dumpty on the wall. They have to make sure that despite losses in the labor force, despite greening of the labor force, which is World Bank was just discussing, uh, despite variety of social policies it needs to pursue, uh, that as I said, Humpty Dumpty has to stay on a wall. Uh, and the only way to make sure that it does is that the government will interfere more and more, both in business cycles and capital cycles. And that, that's why I'm saying the guy who lost money, perhaps on a triple C debt in the next two quarters, will make it back uh, at the end of 23, early 24. Victor, this reminds me of a conference where I spoke to a... Um... G10 former prime minister and a vice president of a large central bank, they both conveyed the same message. Policymakers do not like tail risks. They like to be in the body of the distribution to control the outcomes. And if the tails are becoming fatter, well, guess what? They're just going to be more proactive in intervening to make sure that, you know, it all goes back into the, 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 the comfortable status quo center of the distribution. Well, Victor, Always a pleasure to have you and have this uh, nice conversation where we all learn something from your expertise. If people want to find more about you, what, what's the best way? Uh, a lot of things we discussed um, actually are in my book that I published, uh, I in, admittedly just before COVID, but a lot of issues uh, predate COVID. Uh, and, so, uh, and so, yes, it, it, it's, uh, uh, that could be one source of information.
Uh, I'm quite active on LinkedIn. That could be another source of information. Uh, and of course, um, any of the clients of Macquarie uh, will have access to uh, my, uh, my regular product. Well, guys, we're going to make sure that we link um, Victor's book under the description of the video. I've read it and I can only recommend it. Please make sure also to subscribe to the Blockworks Macro channel uh, to make sure you don't miss any of these interviews. And if you want to find more about me as well, you can subscribe to my free newsletter. It's called The Macro Compass. Victor, thanks for being here with us and I hope we'll chat soon again. Thank you very much, Al. Look forward to it. Ciao.